in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O God of all spirits and of all flesh, who have destroyed death and overcome the devil, and given life to the world, grant, O Lord, to the souls of your servants who have departed from this life, that they may rest in a place of light, in a place of happiness, in a place of peace, where there is no pain, no grief, no sighing. And since you are a gracious God and the lover of mankind, forgive them every sin they have committed by thought, word, or deed. For there is not a man who lives and does not sin. You alone are without sin. Your righteousness is everlasting and your word is true. You are the resurrection and the life and the repose of your departed servants, O Christ our God. And we give glory to you together with your eternal Father and your all holy, gracious, and life giving spirit both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Kelsey, I'll turn the microphone over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Father Hendrik Heiss. Our speaker this evening is the president of Wyoming Catholic College in Lander, Wyoming. Born in South Carolina and raised in Georgia, Glenn Arbery grew up as a Southerner and a Protestant. His reading of Flannery O'Connor as a freshman at the University of Georgia began his journey toward the Roman Catholic Church. He entered the church at the University of Dallas, where he later took his PhD in literature and politics. He's taught literature at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Thomas More College of Liberal Arts, the University of Dallas, and Assumption College. In 2013, he and his wife, Virginia, went to, to teach at Wyoming Catholic College, of which he became president in 2016. In addition to hundreds of columns, essays, and reviews, he is the author of Why Literature Matters and the editor of The Southern Critics, The Tragic Abyss, and Augustine's Confessions and Its Influence. His novel, Bearings and Distances, was published in 2015, and he has a second novel, Boundaries of Eden, now under consideration. Dr. Arbery and his wife, Virginia, have eight children and 18 grandchildren. Welcome, Dr. Arbery. It's good to have you with us tonight. Welcome, Thank you Dr. very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, just by the way, uh, Boundaries of Eden came out this past week from Wise Blood Books. So if you're, if you're a real glutton for punishment, you know, you might want, <laughs> might want to order that. Dr. Um, we'll, uh, we'll link all your books, I think, in the email. Can we do that, Kelsey? We'll, we'll link all the books for people. Yeah, good. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I want to thank you, Father Hezekiah, and the Institute of Catholic Culture for having me on tonight. And uh, I just wanted to comment that you mentioned and quoted from uh, Father Schmemann. Uh, Father David Anderson is our Byzantine um, chaplain out here at Wyoming Catholic College. We have, we like to say, both lungs of the church here. So we have a, a Roman chaplain and a Byzantine chaplain, which is quite a luxury for a student body of about 190. So, and, and such good ones. Um, yeah, like Father, and Father David is awesome. He does a lot of teaching for the Institute, especially for our Magdalene Apostolate sisters. So uh, please say hello called. for me. Yeah, that's great. It's great to hear that. So what I'm gonna be talking about tonight, <clears throat> just broadly is literature and culture. So I'm gonna be talking tonight about the metaphor of weaving the tale, which is the title of my talk. I think for most of us, this idea of weaving a tale has become something of a commonplace. We don't really hear the metaphor in it. We don't uh, feel the metaphor, so to speak. Um, there was a critic about a century ago named T.E. Hume who said that old metaphors tend to become abstract. They cease to convey a physical thing and they become uh, just a kind of way of talking about something else. Else. For example, we might say to someone, uh, you're really out of line on this. If we say you're out of line, we understand that somebody needs to obey the rules. But we don't necessarily imagine what the ancients would have thought about something like that. For example, if you're in the Greek military and someone says, you know, you're out of line, then what you're doing is endangering the whole uh, battle formation. You've got um, a whole line of men with shields who have, you know, one shield. This shield covers the person next to you. This shield covers you and so on. So for somebody to be out of line opens up that gap and, and endangers everyone in the, in the formation. The same thing with uh, something like the, the Viking shield wall. 
Um, so sometimes these images that we take just as, as kind of figures of speech have a much more visceral or physical kind of meaning that we tend to forget in the way that we talk about uh, literature or the way that we imagine uh, things. So what I'm gonna try to do tonight is take us back into the Homeric world where this, where the image of weaving, the fact of weaving was very much vivid and alive. And I'm gonna try to show some ways that, you know, the, the threads of this, so to speak, get picked up uh, later in the tradition and how all of this forms a kind of pattern that, that keeps culture vital. So in the ancient world, as, as I'm sure you, you know, must know if you think about it for a second, all textiles are made by hand. There is no modern um, manufacture of textiles. Every single thing you wear is made by hand by someone. So in the upper reaches of this art, uh, weaving is really what queens do. It's the, it's the art of women like Helen of Troy or Penelope, the, the wife of Odysseus, or Arete, who, who comes up uh, in the course of the Odyssey, or Dido of Carthage, you know, the great queen who delayed the, you know, the, the movement of Aeneas from Troy to, to the new place he was supposed to found the beginnings of Rome. So in other words, the work is not cooking or house cleaning, but weaving. And the same is true for goddesses like Calypso and Circe in the Odyssey. And Athena herself, you might be aware, in the Greek tradition is the goddess of weaving. Now, if we have the image, I'm not sure that the images are there, but if you have the one of the ancient weaving, Let's look at that. Notice what they're doing here. They have upright looms. So a lot of modern looms tend to be horizontal so that they can be uh, worked more easily. But the ancients uh, in the time of Homer used these vertical looms. They were upright and the threads of the warp where the, the upright threads are held straight, if you can see that, by uh, loom weights at the bottom that hold the strands together and pull them downward so that there's a, a kind of tension on each thread. Um, the shuttle is wielded by the figure on the right. I'm not sure what's going on with that nose. <laughs> I've puzzled over this image for a while. Uh, that's, that's some nose, I have to say. Um, but the figure on the left is, is knocking the, the thread into place, the, the woof, this horizontal thread, also known as the weft. And you see the, that figure pushing it up against the web that's forming at the, at the top of the loom. So if you think about how this works, and then I'm going to read this passage from Moby Dick, where Ishmael who's the narrator of Moby Dick, it's talking about this calm afternoon when he and his cannibal friend Queequeg were making a mat for the use of the boats in the whaling ship. Okay, I'm just gonna pick this up and read it because I think it's a, a good kind of description of what goes on in the act of weaving. Queequeg and I were mildly employed weaving what is called a sword mat for an additional lashing to our boat. I, Ishmael, was the attendant or page of Queequeg while busy at the mat. As I kept passing and repassing the filling or woof of marline between the long yarns of the warp using my own hand for the shuttle, you can kind of see this on this image, and as Queequeg standing sideways ever and anon slid his heavy oaken sword between the threads it's sort of what the figure on the left is doing here. And idly looking off upon the water, carelessly and unthinkingly drove home every yarn. I say, 
So strange a dreaminess did there reign over all the ship and over all the sea, only broken by the intermitting dull sound of the sword that it seemed as if it were the loom of time. There lay the fixed threads of the warp, subject to but one single ever returning unending vibration. And that vibration merely enough to admit of the crosswise interblending of other threads with its own. So Ishmael is seeing this whole thing, as he says in the next paragraph, as the threads of necessity, the free will, which is Ishmael putting his, his uh, shuttle through the weave and then Queequeg knocking it home with the, with the oaken sword, you know, not very carefully so that it kind of looks a little um, disorganized as it finishes. So he, he interprets that in terms of necessity, free will, and chance, which is typical of Ishmael, by the way. He's always full of these mock serious interpretations of the things that he's dealing with. Okay, um, Ishmael and Queequeg are clearly just making a mat. They're um, not engaged in any kind of high art, but Greek weaving, is literally storytelling. And this is where we get into an interesting kind of detail, uh, technical detail, that the scholar at Harvard, Gregory Nige, brings up. He says that any weave that you're making has to have what he calls a starting border that's sewn. You can't weave that. It has to be sewn so that when you push the threads up against it, they'll stay and it won't just unravel the weave. So this word for sewing relates uh, in its etymology to the, the same word that describes the very opening of a poem that lays out the subject matter. So in Lattimore's translation of the Iliad, sing goddess, the anger of Peleus son Achilles and its devastations which put pains thousandfold upon the Achaeans. Um, you're laying out the theme of the whole poem right there. That's what Gregory Nage calls the starting border, which is like that what exists in the, in the weave that you're making on the loom. Um, so the story is woven out from this announcement of the theme and the art of weaving similarly involves this emerging image or story that, that you find on, the, on the, weave, the web itself as the weaver is, um, is doing this. Some of you out there may actually be weavers, in which case I, I would love to hear a little bit later, you know, any insights that you have into this whole process. I can't figure out in ancient weaving how you, you know, you start like this, you get the thread through there, and how you switch. I can't figure out what the mechanism was, how they did that. So if anybody has some insight, I'd love to hear it. So in any case, the, the queens who weave, the artist of the loom, the first appearance of the famous Helen of Troy in the Iliad comes in book three, when a, a goddess goes to call her out so that she can come up to the walls and look out at the city, look out at the Greeks who are showing themselves. And here's the first appearance of Helen in the Iliad in Homer's description. She was weaving a great web, a red folding robe and working into it the numerous struggles of Trojans, breakers of horses and bronze armored Achaeans struggles that they had endured for her sake at the hands of the war god. Now you remember the whole of the Trojan War centers on Helen as its purpose because she's stolen from her husband Menelaus by the Trojan Paris. The Greeks go to get her back. There's a 10 year siege and so on. So what she's doing the first time we see her is weaving the stories of these conflicts into this great robe that, that she's making. We're not told for whom. So to weave makes the story visible. Stories are, are webs. They're things that are woven. 
and lines of poetry as you look at them on the page might remind you of those lines of the woof, right, as, as they go across the, the web of the loom. Um, just as a side note, there was a way that the Greeks um, wrote at one point is so that they would take a line and then you would go to the end of it and you would just turn over. It's as though you turned your paper over like this, you know, and you just keep going. So it's, it's very much like the way that um, Helen is described or we see Ishmael is described as using the shuttle and forming that, that line. Same image as a plowing. So that someone gets to the end of a row, turns the horses or the oxen, goes back the other way. It's that same motion of back and forth and weaving and then these other ways of um, doing crucial things for, for the culture of the Greeks. So what do we mean when we talk about the threads of a story? Um, I was thinking about this this afternoon. It's very interesting that we still that use that same word for emails and texts. So that when someone uh, starts, a, you know, let's say my one of my um, children sends an email to all the siblings and says, you know, I've got a new address, here it is. And then there's this exchange of emails. And you call that sequence of, of emails a thread because it all deals with the basically the same topic. You know, somebody might announce, you know, a week or two later, you know, they're pregnant. Uh, this happens often with my seven daughters. <laughs> Sorry, we're up to, um, by the end of January, 22 grandchildren. So anyway, this announcement of new babies comes fairly frequently. But in any case, the point is there's a thread that goes you know, through the emails, same thing when you get text messages and so on. So what are we thinking when we, when we use that metaphor? Um, the threads of narrative in a story are very much like these distinct themes and they develop you know, one action or another through the whole of, of what we're looking at as the story. So I wanna, I wanna use the Odyssey as the example and take the thread of Odysseus journey home from the island of Calypso. I'm not gonna try to deal with too much of the poem, but just this part which has always struck me as really uh, profoundly applicable to our situation in many ways. Um, the first time you see Odysseus, I'm not, I'm not saying that <laughs> literally this is everyone's situation, but the first time you see Odysseus in the poem, he's on the beach staring out over the water with no way to get home and weeping because, you know, he, he doesn't have a um, any conveyance. He doesn't have any assurance that he's going to be able to get back to his wife and his son. So this sense of um, this sort of helplessness that afflicts the man at this point in, in his journeys. He's been on the island of Calypso, who is a goddess, for the past seven years. So let me dig into this just a little bit. Um, I know some of you have read the Odyssey. It may have been some time ago. So if you just remember the general situation of the poem, it's 10 years after the Trojan War. Odysseus, you know, one of the great heroes of the Greeks, is still not home. Um, he's been gone now for 20 years. The war took 10, another 10, him trying to get home. His wife, Penelope, is surrounded by suitors. She's, you know, quite the prize, um, a, a kind of Helen in her own right, except without the uh, obvious infidelity of, of Helen. And Odysseus' son Telemachus is suffering humiliations in this situation. He can't send the suitors away. So Athena intervenes to get Zeus and the other gods to help send Odysseus home. For the past seven years, as I mentioned, Odysseus has been 
held against his will on the island of the goddess Calypso. Now, this is a beautiful goddess. It's a beautiful island. You know, it's a billionaire's dream, you know, the isolated island. I'll get to the description of it in just a second. But Odysseus um, does not consent to be there any longer. And so he's in the situation of, I think, people who get to that stage of their lives where all the energy is run out. They can't seem to find what it is that moved them to begin with. They have no capacity to uh, get started again on, on the journey home, whatever we understand that journey home to be. So Zeus sends the god Hermes, who is the messenger god, as you might recall, to spur Calypso to, to let Odysseus go so that he can make his way home. So if you have the text available there, I'm going to look at the one about Calypso, uh, it might be the second one on your handout, it begins, but after he had made his way, if you can find that one. Hermes has to fly across a great deal of water. I think it's sort of like front flying from California to Hawaii, something like that. The way that Hermes complains about it is pretty much that bitter. Uh, he says, why would anybody do this? So let's pick it up. But after he had made his way to the far lying island, Hermes stepped then out of the dark blue sea and walked on over the dry land until he came to the great cave where the lovely haired nymph was at home and he found that she was inside. There was a great fire blazing on the hearth and the smell of cedar split in billets and sweet wood burning spread all over the island. She was singing inside the cave with a sweet voice as she went up and down the room and wove with a golden shuttle. Now skipping a few lines in the text, but and right about the hollow cavern extended a flourishing growth of vine that ripened with grape clusters. Next to it, there were four fountains and each of them ran shining water, each next to each, that turned and ran in sundry directions. And round about there were meadows growing soft with parsley and violets, and even a god who came into that place would have admired what he saw, the heart delighted within him. So there, there are several things to notice here. Uh, first is the Edenic beauty of this island. When Milton writes Paradise Lost, and I'll point to a scene in that a little bit later, um, he draws on this description of Calypso's island to try to get at that, um, you know, that, that quality of what Eden must have been like for our first parents. Um, but Odysseus has grown weary of this. <clears throat> he refuses Calypso's offer to immortalize him in the in the greek myths the gods can give you ambrosia and nectar you know you eat the ambrosia and drink the nectar and it it's what sustains you in your immortality this is what the gods of the greeks uh, eat and drink uh, calypso has offered this to odysseus many times now odysseus uh, lives on this island with calypso whose name means something like concealer, you know, the concealer goddess. Um, he doesn't want eternal concealment. So even though he's in this Edenic spot, uh, he, he longs to be elsewhere, to be back in the real world, so to speak, back in a real life where there's actual danger, the kind of um, suffering that actual human beings undergo and the realities of death, you know, that Father Hezekiah was just pointing us to. Um, there's nothing like that on Calypso's Isle. So this thread starts when a divine emissary comes to rescue Odysseus to remind Calypso that he needs to go home. So the second thing to notice here is the weaving of Calypso. You have a scene with the goddess, what's she doing? She's weaving. 
What is she weaving? Elsewhere, we learn that this is the immortal clothing that she gives to Odysseus. It's called ambrosial clothing. So it's um, immortal, but what could be the story in the weave, if you follow me here? In Helen's weaving, we get the Trojan War, right? The fighting for her between the, between the, the Greeks and the Trojans. In Calypso's weave, what's the story on this beautiful island? Um, day after day, week after week of uneventful vacation, so to speak, right? Um, everything goes on and on. It's very pleasant, but it doesn't, it doesn't have any, any story to it. There's no drama, there's no difficulty. So ultimately it's not interesting. It's certainly not like Helen's web. So this is an art with no story to tell. And this is uh, Odysseus there stranded uh, trying to get away. So finally, Calypso reluctantly lets him build a raft and sail away. And she even sends him favoring winds, which the goddesses seem privileged to do. Um, Odysseus gets in sight of land. The god Poseidon, who hates him, sends down a storm and breaks up his raft. And Odysseus has to swim for a couple of days with a, a kind of life vest that keeps him afloat. Um, and in the process, he has to take off the, the clothing that Calypso gave him, this immortal clothing, because it's weighing him down. If he didn't take it off, it would drown him. It would pull him under. So Odysseus finally crawls ashore. He's completely naked. He's crusted with salt. Um, Homer's good on these details. There's salt in his nostrils. His lips are swollen. You know, everything about him is, uh, looks like somebody who's been at sea for days. He spends that first night in a pile of leaves under an olive tree. And you have to ask, you know, what is, what is Homer showing us here? What is he getting at? by showing us this great hero reduced to absolutely nothing. He's had nothing to eat for days. He's had nothing to drink. Um, he's naked, uh, has no shelter. So apparently he's reduced just to bare nature. Um, Shakespeare's King Lear sees someone in this condition and calls him a poor bear fort animal. You know, that's almost like what, what um, Odysseus strikes us as here. This is not Adam and Eden, if you follow me. This is, this is fallen man, um, very much reduced, but in, in a, as Odysseus shows, her, shows us pretty quickly, he's by no means resourceless. The next morning, he's awakened by this young uh, girl, named Nausicaa, who is at the uh, river and the, the beach washing the clothes of, of her family. So notice the, the theme of clothing that begins to emerge here. It's the funniest scene in the Odyssey. Uh, Odysseus is compared to a lion <laughs> coming upon a, a, a fold of sheep um, as he comes out to approach these young girls. He doesn't have any clothes, so he's holding a, a branch in front of himself and coming out to, to, see these, uh, to see these girls. Luckily, his language is such that he's able to appeal to Nausicaa and convince her by the, by the story he tells, by the, the way he weaves um, his, his speech, that this is a man of, you know, high intelligence of real accomplishment. And so she lets him bathe. She clothes him with some of the garments that her mother actually wove. Um, and then she goes into the city separately, but Odysseus comes into the city where he's, he's welcomed by, by the people of this city. The first sign of culture, you could say, 
is his capacity to weave this story to tell her. And the second sign, almost as important, is this clothing. What's this relation between clothing and culture or civilization? Um, just this morning, I saw about a, this notice about a new book uh, by a woman named Virginia Postrel. Uh, some of you may have read earlier works of hers, but she has a new book called The Fabric of Civilization, How Textiles Made the World. And I suspect that if you looked in that book, you would see some of the material I've been covering. You know, this is the textiles, the way that you make textiles has something to do with the way that you understand your whole civilization. As a naked man on the beach, Odysseus is nobody, which is the name he's used earlier in the poem when he speaks to the Cyclops in, in the Cyclops cave. But what's, what's interesting here is that clothing doesn't hide his nature. It reveals his nature. It reveals him as deeply experienced in the world and deeply cultured. When he has this clothing, this weave, he can be introduced into a sophisticated society and make such a profound impression that the king Alkenowus offers him Nausicaa, um, his daughter, in marriage after about 10 minutes of conversation. It's a startling moment, I have to say. Um, the queen accepts Odysseus because she recognizes this clothing that she made. So it's, you know, the weave of, of, of her work coming into contact with, with the story of Odysseus. As the poem goes on, um, we get Odysseus identifying himself, you know, he's, he's a famous man in the Greek world. He's actually heard the storyteller in the palace singing the songs about the Trojans and the Greeks at the war, and he's been the hero in several of these accounts. So when he identifies himself, I'm Odysseus, son of Laertes, and my fame goes up to the heavens. You don't get the reaction described, but you can imagine it, you know, on this audience of listeners uh, in the palace of this king where he's appeared. Now, he begins at that point to weave the story of his wanderings. And these are the ones I think you are probably all aware of, the, the story of the Cyclops, right, the one-eyed giant, uh, the story of the sirens who lure you to your death by their singing, uh, the story of, of Circe, this other goddess who has enchantments. She turns Odysseus men into pigs. Uh, but all these accounts of his movements back and forth across the sea to these various adventures that begin to build up the, the whole weave of, of his story. Um, certain places come back up, you know, there you go there, you come back, so that there's this movement of, of repetition that seems to me very much like what the movement of, of weaving is. You lay one line down, you come back over it, you lay the other line down, and so on. Um, this is a, a technique in weaving, and I think also a technique in the way that the, the poem is put together in this complex weave. Now, in another thread of the story, Odysseus' wife, Penelope, has been back in Ithaca trying to fend off these suitors. She's, uh, they've been in the house of Odysseus now for three years, trying to tempt her, you know, give presents to her family, give presents to her, to try to get her to accept them as, uh, except one of them as, as her husband. Uh, she keeps holding out hope that Odysseus himself will come home. So that's where we are in this quotation from, um, from the Odyssey about the great loom that Penelope sets up. Um, the chief suitor here that's mentioned, Antinous, is truly 
a vile human being. Uh, we, we get uh, more about his character as we go through the poem. This is very early on in the poem. Um, Odysseus' son Telemachus has called an assembly and he's asked the people of Ithaca to help him get these suitors out of his house. And this is when Antinous, the suitor, stands up and tells the assembly about Penelope and what she's been doing uh, for these past several years. So let me just read this. <clears throat> she set up, this is Antinous talking about Penelope. She set up a great loom in her palace. Now you picture one like the one we saw in that earlier uh, depiction of, of the vertical loom, right? The upright loom. She set up a great loom in her palace. It must have been right out in front of all of them and set to weaving a web of threads, long and fine. Then she said to us, young men, my suitor is now that the great Odysseus has perished. Wait, though you are eager to marry me until I finish this web so that my weaving will not be useless and wasted. This is a shroud for the hero Laertes. For when the destructive doom of death, which lays men low, shall take him, lest any Achaean woman in this neighborhood hold it against me that a man of many conquests lies with no sheet to wind him. So she's thinking about the funeral shroud for the father of Odysseus, you know, and the honor that you need to do for the dead. Um, so she, all right, so she spoke and the proud heart in us was persuaded. Thereafter in the daytime, she would weave at her great loom. But in the night she would have torches set by and undo it. So for three years, she was secret in her design, convincing the Achaeans. But when the fourth year came with the seasons returning, one of her women who knew the whole of the story told us and we found her in the act of undoing her glorious weaving. So against her will and by force, she had to finish it. I'll be interested later um, to hear what some of you think about this. Um, it seems to me that Penelope has obviously been trying not to finish the story. You know, if there's a story in the, in the web that she's making She's trying not to let that story be over. Um, to put the shroud on the father of, of Odysseus is also in a way to put the shroud on Odysseus himself, because when she finishes it, she has to admit that Odysseus is not coming home, that he's dead. And then she uh, marries someone else. And, and that story, if you follow me, that story is over. So she's been trying not to finish that story. Um, she's been giving Odysseus <coughs> uh, time you know, to come home, uh, even though the time seems to have been ample so far. If we could see the other image, um, I wanna make a quick point about this. We had an image of the loom and also had an image of a ship. And the point is this, you notice the similarity of the sail of the ship to the loom, the way that the, the sail hangs down from the beam that goes across. The, the Greeks have the same word for loom and mast. So they're both this upright, you know, that sustains the beam. So when Penelope works at the loom, and Odysseus and his ship tries to get home. You see the, the kind of conjoining of, of these threads of the story. What would it mean that, that this is the, the same word in the, way that, um, in the way that this story works out? So uh, Odysseus journey away from Ithaca at the beginning of the war um, was by ship. He's been since then all over the world on his adventures, you know, this way and that way, coming and going, um, weaving the story with his travels, one thing after the other, right? The gradual pattern emerging. 
And finally, he ends where he began in Ithaca and <clears throat> where the poem itself begins back in book one. So this is story from 20 years ago, the story of the poem, all of these things coming back together in the same place. And you assume, I think, that from now on, this is the story that's gonna go into Penelope's weaving just as it goes into the making of this poem itself, into the making of the Odyssey. So these connections, and I've spent quite a while on the Odyssey, which I dearly love, as you can probably tell. I love it almost as much as I love the Iliad, but <laughs> that's another story. In any case, the connections that you make here between weaving and stories, um, has a lot to do with the way that literature itself forms the larger weave or fabric of culture. Um, there's a passage in the great 20th century poet T.S. Eliot, who, who wrote some famous works you might have had to read in college, uh, The Wasteland, I uh, probably gave you indigestion. Um, but others of his, like the Four Quartets, which he wrote in the 1940s, are some of the highest um, Christian poetry that's been written in, in several centuries. Um, Eliot is a convert in 1927. He was Anglo-Catholic, um, but his, his movement into Christianity through his work, I think, has a lot to do with his seeing this, this weave of, of the culture of the Western tradition. And certainly more than almost any other poet in the 20th century, um, he tried to continue what he saw as that great tradition. He has an essay from 1919. This is actually before his conversion. It's called Tradition and the Individual Talent. And if you have that on your handout, I'd just like to read a few sentences from it because I think it's, it's pretty startling in what Eliot is saying, it's startling, you know, a century later. He says, this isn't that startling, but you know, it kind of goes against the idea of pure originality for any artist. He says, no poet, no artist of any art has his complete meaning alone. And skip down a few lines. What happens when a new work of art is created is something that happens simultaneously to all the works of art which preceded it. The existing monuments form an ideal order among themselves, which is modified by the introduction of the new, really new work of art among them. The existing order is complete before the new work arrives. So, I mean, if you're thinking, if you're in, you know, first century AD Greece, you think that the whole order of literature has already been formed. You know, you've got Homer, you've got the Iliad and the Odyssey, you've got the great tragic writers, Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides, you've got the great lyric poets, and so on. And you're pretty sure that this, this you know, this constitutes literature. Um, the same thing I, I think would apply, say, to the Old Testament. That's scripture. And then when the New Testament comes, you with me? When the New Testament comes, the whole way that you read the Old Testament begins to change. It's not, it, you know, it, it has a new configuration now because of this new um, emphasis that, that Christ brings uh, in the resurrection and the whole story of the way that the Old Testament foretells his coming. Um, it's, this is one of the things that happen, say, on the road to Emmaus, when he's explaining to the, you know, to the two walking that way, um, what the scriptures mean and how they're fulfilled uh, in Christ. So similarly, Eliot's saying, the old order of, of literature exists in what seems complete until something really new comes along and changes the way that you have to understand that configuration. So Eliot's saying the past is going to, the way that you understand the past, 
will be altered by that new work, by the present work, as much as the present is directed by the past. Let me try to uh, tease out a little bit what I think Eliot means using Homer's poem as, as sort of that starting border. You know, there's Homer, and then there are all the tragic poets, there's Virgil, there's Dante, there's Milton, and so on, right? Um, so you think of Homer's poems as that, that border that holds the others in place. Let's think about that a minute. <clears throat> um, just in terms of the time we're talking about. Scholars think that the Homeric poems were, were composed orally. There was an oral tradition that had a certain way that you could uh, understand the line of poetry. I, I won't get into details, but in any case, it's a, you know, it's a tradition passed down from one generation to the next for centuries. About the eighth century BC, scholars think, is when the Homeric poems were made one thing, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and written down. So writing, you know, actual literature, the, the letters, the um, writtenness of it wasn't a, a factor for the Greeks until the eighth century BC. Um, over 700 years later, Virgil writing in Augustan Rome, that is Rome under Caesar Augustus, um, imitates Homer. So this is a different country, it's a different language, different history, different, you know, different culture, you could say, pretty much all together. Um, but Virgil in the Aeneid imitates the two poems of Homer. The first part of the Aeneid is about the wanderings of Aeneas, and so it imitates the the Odyssey, and you know, and the whole idea of, of homecoming. The second part of the Aeneid imitates the Iliad, which is about battles and wars around, around the city of Troy. Um, so you could think of that as a way that Virgil builds on Homer. But he also takes up particular threads. So just for example, what we've been looking at with Hermes going to Calypso to tell her to release Odysseus, you know, to get this man out of, out of being dead in the water, so to speak, almost literally, um, and get him home, get him moving, give there some impetus and purpose to his life again. Um, Virgil does this also. Uh, Aeneas is destined to found Rome. This is what the gods have repeatedly assured him. He's destined to get to Italy from Troy. Um, so he flees burning Troy with his ships and the men uh, who escape from Troy with him. They sail around the Eastern Mediterranean thinking, you know, they're gonna found a place here, found a city there, and they keep getting pushed on until finally there's a great storm and Aeneas and his men are washed up on the shore of Africa near the city of Carthage. Um, the queen there who comes from sort of the you know, area of Israel in the Eastern Mediterranean. She's from Tyre, which is also a biblical city. Um, Queen Dido welcomes the men because of the signs that she receives from the gods. And she falls desperately in love with Aeneas. Um, so Aeneas is, you know, stays with Dido in a kind of marriage for a year until Jupiter, the, you know, the head of the gods, sees that Aeneas is neglecting his real purpose, which is to get to Italy you know, and found the line that ultimately leads to Rome. So he sends Mercury down to speak to Aeneas and tell him that you know, he needs to um, get on the move. He needs to leave Dido behind and get his uh, men to, to Italy instead of wasting their time here. So what does this mean? Does this mean that Virgil is too unoriginal to come up with his own story? You know, he has to get the thing where the god goes and tells the hero to get on the move or, or what? Um, what does it 
saying when Virgil takes up this thread from Homer and uses something similar. I think immediately you start to see these comparisons, these ironies that, that Virgil's able to use. Aeneas is like Odysseus with Calypso. He's being kept from his real destiny. There's a parallel, but there's a difference because Aeneas stays there willingly and wears the clothes that Dido makes for him. When, when the messenger god Mercury, who is the Roman Hermes, arrives, he notices that Aeneas is wearing this cloak, I'm just quoting here, a cloak of glowing Tyrian purple that drapes his shoulders, a gift that the wealthy queen had made herself, weaving into the weft a glinting mesh of gold. <laughs> so Aeneas has this kind of glittering purple um, robe that, that he's wearing that, that Dido herself made. So um, there's another thread here that, that Virgil's playing off of, and that's the fact that Odysseus spent a year with Circe willingly. This is another goddess. But um, you see my point. Dido is the concealer of Aeneas' real destiny, and he must leave in order to fulfill his real purpose. But there are differences that, that make uh, Virgil's story richer for playing off of what Homer's done earlier in, in writing the Odyssey. I hope what I'm saying is clear here, because I'm going to make one more um, comparison here. Much later in the tradition, uh, this is 1700 years after Virgil, and you think of these, these kind of leaps, uh, totally different culture, once again. We're, in, we're now in 17th century England. This is um, well after the Reformation. The Puritans have overthrown the King of England. You know this story. Oliver Cromwell is the Lord Protector. Milton, the, uh, the poet, served under Cromwell more or less as his Secretary of State, uh, and so on. And we're, we are so far away from the Greece of, of Homer or even the Rome of Virgil that you know, we're virtually in different worlds. And yet, Milton in Paradise Lost picks up the threads that are present from both Homer and Virgil. So there's a um, kind of prologue to the whole action of Paradise Lost that's set in hell and Satan wakes in the lake of burning fire and he and the other devils formulate this plot that they're gonna go and tempt Adam, this new creation and Eve to become members of their party and turn against the God who just created them. So Satan escapes from hell. He's in Eden by the time this happens, but God in order to warn Adam sufficiently sends the angel Raphael down to the garden of Eden to tell Adam and Eve the story of, of Satan's rebellion in heaven, his escape from hell, and the fact that this, um, this deceiver is, is probably close by uh, as they speak. So if you think about the parallels earlier, the angel Raphael parallels Mercury, he parallels Hermes, right? He's there not to get Adam to leave Eden, you see, but, but to try to keep him in Eden. And yet, because Milton has set up these parallels, and you know, we as the readers of the epic tradition, um, sense these parallels, there are these, these questions that, that start to arise. Is Eve, is Eden a kind of Calypso's island? You see, is it, is staying there somehow not really the destiny of humankind? Is it the case that because of um, the redemption to come, you know, that there's a necessity for man to, to leave this idyllic state that, that's like Calypso's island 
and enter the world of suffering and sin and death in order that the great story can unfold of our redemption. I mean, that, that seems to me what, what um, is kind of hinted at here. Um, does Milton mean that Eden is not really man's destiny, that it's kind of that place that, you know, if you let yourself stay there, what does this mean? Is it an urging Adam to sin? I don't think so. But just in the way the poem is built with these threads coming from the previous epics, you see the questions that start to arise. Is Eve Dido? I mean, is there a suggestion that Adam might have remained unfallen if he had been willing to leave Dido? I mean, to leave Eve as, as Aeneas left Dido? Um, you, you get a, a number of questions and puzzles that come out simply because of the overlay, right, of these, of these threads. Um, there are plenty of questions there. Um, for another discussion, I'd welcome any of them uh, shortly. But I'd suggest that the existence of the Aeneid alters the way we think about the Iliad and the Odyssey, particularly the Odyssey. See, that's what Eliot means. When a truly new work comes, it changes the way you think about that pre-existing order. Greek literature may be complete, but now it's different because of the existence of, of this Roman epic. Similarly, the divine comedy changes how we think about the Aeneid and the Homeric poems. Milton, same thing. So what I'm suggesting is all these ties, these connections, are part of the fabric of culture. They're certainly part of the way that literature speaks to itself, speaks to others over great lengths of time and forms this um, complex whole. So let me uh, use one last example um, from very much from the modern novel. Uh, this is from Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Hero of this novel is a, is a student. He's 22 or so. Um, he's full of uh, ideological ideas. He thinks that the truly strong individual should be able to step over the law, you know, to transgress without any kind of penalty. Um, he admires people like Napoleon or Caesar who are willing to commit, you know, great crimes in order to achieve their power. Um, so Raskolnikov's test for himself is whether he can kill this old pawnbroker in the neighborhood whom he thinks of as truly a kind of blight on society. Uh, he, he thinks that he can take her money and use it for good ends and it will be, um, it'll be more useful than her life could possibly be. But the way that Dostoevsky handles the whole story is to make us imagine at the, at the beginning of the novel and then keep returning us to it through the rest of the novel, this little room where Raskolnikov lives at the top of a boarding house. It's summer in St. Petersburg, Russia. It's hot, it's muggy, and Raskolnikov lives in this, well, look at the description in your handout. It was a tiny closet about six paces long, but most pathetic appearance with yellow dusty wallpaper coming off the walls everywhere and such a low ceiling that a man of any height felt creepy in it and kept thinking he might bump his head every moment and so on, you know, so on with the description. Half the room is taken up with this couch that Raskolnikov uses as a bed. And what I wanna suggest is that even Dostoevsky you know, several centuries after Milton, is still thinking in terms of the same basic thread here. That is, this is a kind of ironic Calypso's Island, a kind of anti-Calypso's Island. Um, it gives us an external image of Raskolnikov's inner isolation and obsession. This is the kind of entrapment in his own psyche that Raskolnikov um, experiences. In the way the novel works, he goes from this room to check the old pawnbroker out, and then he kills her the next night, comes back, 
you know, in this series of movements out from this room, all sort of winding the, the narrative around the same place, which allows us to see at each reiteration of it, how the character has changed, what, what, how the action is developing, and how this story is, is um, sort of emerging as we go through. Um, also, uh, the more people crowd into this room, um, the more it reflects the way that his sense of his own isolation is being um, challenged and changed by those who love him. So his sister, Dunya, um, this luminous figure you might remember from the novel named Sonia, his friend Raju Meekin, all these people we see in Raskolnikov's room, which means that they're also kind of coming to that island of isolation that he thought he had made for himself. This is a story of redemption, um, which I think underlies all of these things we've been talking about. Ultimately, what we're talking about is someone who is, um, I mean, you don't want to allegorize it, but somebody who is um, trapped in sin, trapped in, in some way of being that, that stifles the full unfolding of who they can be and who they're really destined to be. Um, that's certainly what goes on with Raskolnikov here. Um, ultimately, he has to be released from this room into, uh, you know, into the confession of his crime, into uh, going to Siberia, where uh, ultimately he, he has his conversion. But he's being called out of this, this situation of abjectness, you know, loneliness, raggedness. Uh, he's literally reclothed by, by his one of his friends in, in the course of this novel. So um, just to conclude, I think we, we see culture um, as, as this weave of text. And the very word text, you know, is about, it's got this kind of textile image in it. Um, culture clothes us with the complexity that reveals, doesn't conceal, it reveals. What, what human nature really is. You don't find human nature by, you know, stripping everything away and there's, there you are, right? That's not who you are. Who you are is revealed by the things that are made, the things that, that um, give, give uh, witness to, to the higher nature. Culture gives us a story complex enough to take us into the future because we've really encountered what, what the past was, uh, what the genius was in, in the tradition that we too easily think that we simply inherit by being alive and living in the context of it. I think Eliot's absolutely right. He says you have to earn the tradition. You have to work at it so that it, you'll, you'll gain uh, what it is that is present in it. But culture gives us a place and a name, and it gives us a, a measure, I think, that allows us not to think too easily that, that we're better than those in the past, you know, that we are, um, we're at the top of, top of it all right now. I think uh, what the, the whole tradition, the whole fabric that I've been talking about truly reveals is that, that we have a lot to live up to and that um, our humility is a good starting point. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you all very much for listening. I look forward to your question. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Arbery. That was really, really wonderful. Um, yeah, I thought it was um, just so intriguing how you chose to present this through stories themselves. I think that was just beautiful descriptive way to to kind of like bring us into these ideas that you've shared with us tonight all right so dr arbery i'd like to um just start with a question of my own actually before we get into some of the attendee questions but you know i was thinking as you were going through your talk and just remembering back to when 
I read some of these texts, but for me, it's been since high school and probably the same for many. Um, and I was just really struck with how important it is, as you were saying, to understand texts, to, to understand the ones that came before them. And I think that is something that is lost a lot in our society and in our culture, like um, this emphasis on these great foundational works of literature. So I guess my question would be two part. One is how, um, how can an individual kind of re-educate themselves so that they can even recognize the questions in a text, let alone be able to find the answers to it? And then what do you, do you have any suggestions um, for what we could do as a culture um, to kind of help reclaim that uh, important aspect of our culture? Yeah, I, just first one first. Um, I think it's hard to read these works alone. I, I really do. Um, the emphasis that I put on the oral nature of these epics suggests that in the in the original um, experience of, of these poems, say by the Greeks all over the islands in the Aegean, um, there would be a bard who would go who had memorized huge, I mean, huge amounts, maybe days worth uh, of uh, maybe three days to recite the Odyssey. Um, but, but you would experience it communally. And after you hear it, you, you imagine people going, you know, and going home or, you know, getting together and talking about it. You know, how did you understand this? What do you think it means that, that Penelope you know, weaves it during the day and unweaves it at night. What is that? We know, what, what are we looking at there? We immediately intuit something, you know, so you imagine a, a conversation springing up like that. Um, I think solitude is, is kind of our enemy here. I mean, in some ways, you know, silence and solitude are obviously great spiritual resources, but in these matters of, of culture, they're not. Uh, what you need is it's friendship. Um, you need shared stories in order to, to have the same sort of range of reference over things. And then it becomes a kind of shorthand, you know, or you're acting like so-and-so, you know, some character. You're acting like Antonowitz or you're acting like, a, you know, um, you're holding me back, you're whatever. You know, you've got a whole range of, um, of figures who enter into that conversation. So I guess I'd suggest picking great text and trying to have reading groups, uh, even online. You know, what, what's wrong with that, right? You know, if you get several people together just to take some time and talk through these things. Um, and the second part of your question had to do with culture at large, I think, right? Yes. Um, I think you can trace back the roots of a rejection of the greatness of the past a long way. Um, you, you certainly find it in, say, in philosophy, you know, in Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes in the early 17th century. They're explicitly rejecting Aristotle. Maybe the scholastic tradition went overboard, you know, whatever, but they're, they're, they're kind of jettisoning the past and trying to start over. Um, I don't think doing that with, with literature makes any sense at all. Um, we are not talking about a continuous culture. I mean, I've tried to emphasize this several times in this talk. The culture of Virgil in Augustan Rome is extraordinarily different from the culture of, of the composition of the Homeric poems, you know? And you try to blend them all and say, you know, the classics are oppressing us. That's absurd. Um, each one is a kind of remaking or re-understanding of what's come before, long before, and trying to take, take the greatness of it and realize it again in, in your own age. Um, I think the, the tendency of um, many people now is, is to think that anything that comes from the past uh, oppresses us because it's um, poorly thought out. Um, it serves whatever the ruling class is of the day, et cetera, et cetera. 
and the more you read them, the, the more indoctrinated you are, and it's a, you know, um, I, I was once in a seminar where this was in the early 90s. Uh, this stuff's been going on for a while. Um, where the some of the participants would not read the Aeneid because they associated the Aeneid with the oppression of the, the indigenous peoples in Central America by the Spaniards in the 1500s. It's all the same thing. Really? You, you know, I mean, is it, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, uh, Spain was, was colonizing, but is there anything you could learn from the Aeneid about um, what, that, what that impulse to take the past and realize it in a new place is actually about? So, I mean, it's just, it is a sort of um, blanket rejection of some things that you think you know about you don't actually know anything about it whatsoever. So I, I find that um, an extraordinarily um, pervasive problem right now. That's why schools like ours exist, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Kind of going a little further on, you were mentioning Descartes in um, philosophy, but Elizabeth is writing in this question. She's asking, um, in your opinion, what major breaks or cleavage in culture in the past would you see as most significant and how much has literature played a part in mending that cloth? Um, I guess the, you know, the, the major one, at least for literature, the major break was the, the long period between um, the classical period of Roman or Latin literature and anything that, that came after it. Um, there were some early uh, Christian poets that, that I don't, I, I admit, I don't know very well. I'm reading a book by uh, Robert Payne called The Holy Fire that Father David Anderson recommended to me. Sort of a popular book about the early church fathers, um, the, the Eastern fathers. And he, you know, in there, he discusses a number of um, Christian poets that I, you know, simply we don't have available to us. So there was a, a huge break in that sense between the end of um, Rome, you know, you want to say, you know, mid 400s AD and the rise of vernacular literatures in, in Europe. Um, this, this is the medieval romances, the lyric poets of the Provençal poets and others, and then uh, Dante um, in the, uh, Dante's born 1265, you know, um, he dies in 1321. Uh, Divine Comedy is a level of literature that, you know, is, is simply unchallenged, unmatched by any, anything between um, 19 BC when Virgil died and, and his own day. So that's a pretty huge break. I think literature, helps to mend the effects of that break. Um, when, you, when you read through Dante's poem, you see the way that he incorporates um, the classical tradition and weds it to the Christian one uh, in a way uh, analogous to what Thomas Aquinas does with Aristotle and, and Christian theology. Um, I think that's one way of seeing that, that attempt at healing. Um, other breaks, uh, I think there's, there's a break sort of after Shakespeare's age. Um, Milton is kind of the last of Shakespeare's age. Uh, that's, that's a little different. That has to do with, not with the loss of culture, but with some sense of um, the greatness that, that you, you find everywhere in Shakespeare's plays, you know, the characters, the speech, um, and anything that comes dramatically or poetically for a couple of centuries. I mean, that's harsh, but um, I mean, I, I, it, it does feel like something happened there that was some kind of break. Anyway, that's a great question. It, it requires a good deal more thought than I'm capable of at the moment. <laughs> sure, yeah. It's kind of putting you on the spot with that one. Um... This question is coming in from an anonymous attendee, actually. Um, 
although they should have put their name because I think it's a good one. And this question, um, to be fair, is also kind of a hard one to answer because you, um, I'm sure there's so many answers you could give, but, and you don't want to leave anyone out, but if you could answer, um, this person's asking, do you have recommendations of authors who are writing today who are continuing the thread of, um, you know, seeing seeing the importance of the tradition, literary tradition on which they stand and really trying to do justice to the art of literature? Yeah, that, that is a, that's a tough question. Um, I don't, I don't think of anybody writing today who is a, you know, is at that level, right, that we're talking about with, with Homer, Virgil, Dante, Milton. Um, Melville was, was pretty good, I have to say. Moby Dick uh, bears rereading um, many, many times. Uh, and if you, you haven't taken it seriously, I, I would surely recommend that. Um, contemporary writers, oh boy. Um, I just read, recently read a novel by Christopher Beha, B-E-H-A, called The Index of Self-Destructive Acts, which is sort of worth reading just for the title alone. <laughs> you feel like, you know, you could come up with your own. Um, that's, that's quite an accomplished novel. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of, you know, uh, I can recommend some, some poets, uh, Richard Wilbur, uh, a Christian poet of, of first order. He died about three or four years ago. Um, I think everybody should go back and read Robert Frost and, and certainly uh, T.S. Eliot. But, you know, my contemporaries, I'm afraid I'm a little, a little shallow on. Oh, that's okay. Um, let's end with this kind of fun question. Um, Dr. Arbery, what would you say your top three favorite works of literature are? Well, um, the top one, believe it or not, is, is the Iliad. Uh, I love the Iliad very much. Um, I guess Divine Comedy or the Odyssey are so sort of tied for second. And third, I guess would be Shakespeare's King Lear, but I have, you know, several hundred other favorites and <laughs> which I'd love to talk about also. But yeah, I guess those are my top three. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, well <laughs> yeah, right. Good. Well, thank you so much again for being with us. This has really been such a pleasure and um, we would love to have you back at the Institute sometime soon.